。早前，英国《金融时报》援引政府内部人员消息称，英国政府认为华为安全风险可控，一时引起英国媒体和智库的热议。但在二十一日，英国国家网络安全中心负责人马丁在布鲁塞尔的一个会议上发言，似乎证明了之前各种报道提到过的英国政府对华为放下戒备的传闻。马丁说：“相信华为所构成的任何安全风险都是可控的。”他还指出，华为的产品在政府情报官员监管之下经过了安全审查。英国在过去十五年都成功管理了华为在英国通讯网络中的行为，所以决定继续这么做。据《纽约时报》称，如果英国不禁用华为，对白宫而言将会是一次挫败。这似乎加深了五眼联盟国家的矛盾。其实，不仅仅是五眼联盟国家，现在许多欧洲国家也加入到华为的争议讨论中来。《纽约时报》还称，尽管美国已经基本禁用华为，美国国务卿蓬佩奥还在欧洲游说各国不用这家中国公司的产品和网络。华为在欧洲其实已经扎根。华为和德国电信公司的合作，以及德国官方最近的表态，称他们初步决定要让华为参与当地 5G 网络合约，都让美国更加紧张。今天与我们连线的嘉宾 John Lee 曾在澳大利亚国防部担任政策分析专员，现在是驻扎伦敦的独立研究员，专门研究网络地缘政治和中美技术之争。Hi John. Hello. Can you hear me? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks.、Um. 在我们的对话中，李提到各界焦虑的讨论 5G 问题，很多原因是因为 5G 代表的是通讯行业的一次巨变，这样的巨变也会带来巨大的安全隐患。比方说，安全部门更不容易察觉可能的网络恶意用途。现在各国政府的表态过程，其实也是在权衡科技发展和信息安全孰重孰轻的过程。各国政府都希望能够为可能的科技发展做好必要的政策准备，因为为 5G 准备的更加充分的国家 ，5G 创新科技的发展会更加顺畅。这也是川普如此看重 5G 的原因。他还说，在华为 5G 问题上，人们比较少谈及的是中国公司和中国政府的关系。他们忽略了许多中国公司承受着政府的压力，中国法律要求中国公司与政府合作。最后，他还提到，接下来的几个月将会非常有趣，因为 5G 升级不仅仅意味着网速增高，它还会带来国家工业上的创新甚至革命。各个国家在华为 5G 问题上面做出的决定非常关键，因为一旦决定运用了华为的 5G 设备，要反悔几乎是不可能的。反悔的经济和科技代价，恐怕许多国家都无法承受。比如，现在很多国家已经在运用华为的基础设施、设备等等。那么，为什么各界对华为 5G 的讨论非常焦虑？欧美各国对华为采取的态度，在网络地缘政治上意味着什么？下面请听我和张丽的讨论。So why is that that when countries are considering the development of 5G, they would always associate the construction of 5G tools or equipment with threats or、um, risk? Like we've seen in the past few weeks, especially in a lot of media stories, that governments are trying to mitigate threats or risk of Huawei's 5G development. How do you think about that? Well, for the reasons that I gave, um, Huawei, sorry, 5G basically represents a step change、um, mm. in the capacities of the internet, um, the things that can be done with it, the number of devices that will be connected to it, um, and obviously that brings a step change in risk. One of the issues with 5G is that a lot of functions which are currently centrally controlled in telecommunications networks are going to be pushed out, as they say, from the core to the edge, which will make it a lot harder for security agencies um to determine whether or not there's a potential compromise or malicious activity, and as I said, also because of the Additional functions that will be possible in a 5G-enabled internet,、um, the so-called Internet of Things, where and the fourth industrial revolution, where a lot more applications will be possible through the internet.、Um, the concern is that a great many more activities are potentially 
compromised by a malicious actor. Mm. So governments um, are obviously trying to hedge against the threat possibilities while they are trying to exploit the benefits mm. that 5G will enable because the Internet of Things, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, applications of 3D printing, um, self-driving cars and a whole variety of other uses that 5G will enable um, obviously will bring great benefits to society as well. So mm -hmm. governments want to be positioned uh, in, order, in order to take advantage of that. Um, and that itself has a competitive aspect. So countries obviously which are more advanced in rolling out 5G networks will be able to develop these use cases and implementations faster. And this may potentially give their companies a competitive advantage versus their foreign rivals. Hence, uh, mm -hmm. apart from the security aspect in the sense of um, the potential use of the internet um, to conduct espionage, um, the theft of information, for example, of intellectual property or mm -hmm. the disabling of critical infrastructure systems, whatever the case may be, um, there is also the economic security issue. And I think that um, the particular focus of the Trump administration on this has really brought the issue of Huawei and 5G into focus. Mm. You bring up a lot of interesting points there, and I wonder, as someone from UK, especially because UK for the past week at least have been in the news a lot because of the Financial Times report that the government is kind of opening door to Huawei. However, there is an interesting observation that a lot of think, think tanks are thinking otherwise. Do you think it's because of the reasons you mentioned previously that they're bringing the financial uh, economic factor into their consideration as well? Well, I think um, first that we don't want to exaggerate um, the uh, positions of various parties. Um, if you're referring to the report by the Royal United Services Institute, um, mm. or rather by their fellows, for example, um, that was uh, the particular individual's views. Mm. Um, and uh, the UK has not made a decision yet on whether 5G, sorry, whether Huawei will be allowed to participate in 5G trials. Um, in fact, uh, some of the networks, the telecommunications providers in the UK are uh, already moving forward with Huawei participation. And of course, um, there is already a lot of Huawei equipment in the existing telecommunications infrastructure. So mm. the issue is quite complicated. Um, in terms of um, a division of views, um, I think it's quite obvious, and this applies both in my native Australia as well as in the UK, um, in the United States, um, pretty much uh, throughout the global discourse um, between uh, security practitioners um, and commentators on the one hand who are skeptical of Huawei's involvement in 5G networks um, and uh, the business community and the telecommunications providers in particular on the other hand um, who obviously want to take advantage of the possibilities of 5G and in this context um, we have to understand that Huawei at the moment is the only provider which is positioned um, to equip 5G rollouts um, mm. there are only three large telecommunications providers in the world now. The other two are not yet at the position that Huawei is in to basically provide end-to-end -end solutions for the 5G trials that many countries are now proceeding with. Hmm. Then going forward, what do you expect the United Kingdom government would respond to this Huawei controversy? Well, I think that it's obviously a subject of intense discussion. Um, mm. The Financial Times report I think you're referring to was the one um, that discussed um, the latest report from the GCHQ Center, which is right. tasked with evaluating Huawei equipment. Mm. Um, so in the context of the strong representations that the U.S. government has been making, which have also been extensively reported on, over the last month or so, um, the latest reports assessment that in fact um, the risk of including Huawei equipment in the network can be mitigated has obviously attracted a lot of attention. But that's not the same as the UK government having made a final decision on this. Mm. Um, and of course, it is not just the UK government. Um, a lot of attention has been given to the German government's deliberations on this issue um, and to the position of the German uh, industrial association and of the uh, major German telecoms provider DT, um, which have been quite vocal in 
not necessarily support of Huawei, but um, in mm. putting the case, uh, there needs to be consideration given to the economic aspects of this. Right. So one of the um, leaked uh, assessments from Deutsche Telekom, for example, was that Germany's Huawei, uh, sorry, Germany's 5G rollout would possibly be delayed by two years or more mm. if the equipment cannot be included in the networks because again they are the only provider equipment manufacturer that is currently positioned to service the rollouts hmm. and my last question would be amid this whole conversation about huawei and whether or not the 5g construction is safe is there something that you think people are getting wrong or have not been talking about I think one problem is that there is, as I mentioned, um, a divergence in views between people who focus on the industry and business side and on the security side. Mm. Um, as a result, you have basically incompatible propositions being advanced. So you have the telecom operators, for example, um, saying that uh, it's important to the, uh, to, of course, their individual business interests, but also the future economic development of their countries for um, 5G to be prioritized, um, which at this point means using Huawei equipment. Mm. And then you have security commentators um, who take a, often a blanket approach and say that um, it is simply not possible to mitigate risk with respect to Huawei because of the relationship that uh, Chinese firms have with the Chinese state. Um, mm. I would say that um, on that side, uh, the relationship between Chinese companies and the Chinese government and the Communist Party um, is often treated in a somewhat reductionist sense by mm. the security commentary. Yes, um, it is true that uh, Chinese firms are subject to pressure in ways that American firms, for example, um, are generally not, um, and that uh, now there are various Chinese laws. Um, the cybersecurity law and the national intelligence laws are the ones that are usually cited mm. which require Chinese firms to cooperate with the Chinese authorities mm. in intelligence matters. But it is also the case as your listeners will well know that the private Chinese firms um, and here of course um, Huawei is a slightly different actor from let's say Tencent or Alibaba they have different histories backgrounds they're involved in different business activities um, there are nuances to their relationship with the Chinese government and its policy making process um, and to their interests as distinct from those of the Chinese government which are not usually treated well mm. particularly in English language coverage hmm. Well, it's going to be an interesting few months. As I mentioned, um, 5G technology is now at the point where many countries are beginning to begin trials and rollouts with a view to bringing um, layers of services progressively online over the next few years. Initially, that will uh, mean faster download speeds for consumers, but over the two to five year time frame, we're likely to see the next layers of the 5G service rolled out, which will enable the more complex industrial applications, which I referred to before. Mm. So obviously, uh, this is a critical period, um, which presumably is why so much political pressure is now being brought to bear by the United States on its allies and third parties, um, not to include Huawei equipment, because the decisions that are made about telecommunications infrastructure over the next year or two are going to have long-term implications. Mm. Once the network infrastructure begins to be constructed and the contracts have been awarded, um, it is going to be difficult to reverse course. Um, and we're already seeing that um, in the case of Huawei equipment um, in existing telco infrastructure where, as I mentioned, um, a lot of providers already have uh, a great uh, sunk cost, if you like, mm. in Huawei equipment, um, uh, particularly since a lot of the existing equipment um, is going to provide the foundation for the initial stages of the 5G rollout. So the opportunity cost from using Huawei equipment over the past 10 years is really large. And if Huawei is accepted, um, 
as an equipment provider for 5G networks going forwards, um, that is going to be very difficult to reverse in future um, if the security and risk assessment changes, never mind about the financial cost. Mm.